Greetings students and welcome to another video on differential equations. In this lesson we're going to discuss perturbations and how to solve nonlinear ODEs, ordinary differential equations, using the perturbation method. Later I'll also be making a sister video to this one for applying perturbations to partial differential equations. Suppose I have an ordinary differential equation that looks something like this, with a function f of the nth derivative of y with respect to x, the lower order derivatives of y, and x plus a perturbation parameter epsilon times a function g of the nth derivative of y, the lower order derivatives of y, and x. All of this is equal to zero. Now just note that the parameter epsilon here is assumed to be very small. Of course this ODE has some initial conditions and or boundary conditions also. I'll call this equation one. Now in typical perturbation problems this function f which isn't multiplying any perturbation parameters, has a known solution when it's by itself, with the initial and boundary conditions mentioned above. And because f has a known solution, f is usually a linear term with respect to y and its derivatives. The reason for this is that linear differential equations have been thoroughly solved by the mathematics community, so it's more likely that we'll find a solution to a differential equation that's linear. On the other hand, this function g that's multiplying the epsilon is usually nonlinear, and it's the nonlinear terms that make things a lot more difficult to solve. So essentially, the typical problem we're solving using perturbation methods is a linear differential equation that is slightly perturbed by a nonlinear term g. The techniques of perturbation methods allow us to solve these special equations where the addition of a complicated nonlinear term prevents us from solving the ODE using more conventional techniques. It's important to note that using perturbation theory gives us approximate solutions to the ODE, not exact analytical solutions. Now along the lines of perturbation methods, what if you were chugging along in life on a linear path but suddenly experienced a perturbation in your academic career? Like you found out you couldn't get that coveted summer research position because your 1000 hour internet trolling experience with your buddy wasn't going to cut it. In that case, it might be a good idea to develop some tangible skills, and there's no better way to do that than by using Skillshare, who have graciously sponsored this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. We're already a few weeks into the new year, so why not set a new year's resolution of learning something tangible and developing your creative side? There's so many lessons on animation, music, web development, and a whole slew of other topics that you can't really go wrong with Skillshare. I myself have been using Skillshare to develop my animation skills. If you saw my quick preview on Platelet Rich Plasma, then you might have noticed that I used animations, which is a departure from my usual style. And the reason I could do those animations was this playlist, which is really good. The videos are super concise and really well taught. Best of all, Skillshare is quite reasonably priced for debt-ridden college students like us. It's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. Now if that sounds good, there's an additional kicker. Because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, I can offer all you guys two free months of a premium Skillshare membership. Click the link in the description below to get two free months of premium membership and explore your creativity. Anyway, let's get back to perturbation methods. When we solve equation 1, we expect a solution y that is a function of both x and the perturbation parameter epsilon. The closer this epsilon is to 0, the closer y is to the simple y of x. Now in order to actually find an expression for y of x comma epsilon, we need to think back to first year calculus. How do we approximate the behavior of a function that has been slightly perturbed from a point that we know about, in this case y of x? Well, we use a Taylor series. What we'll do is that in order to find an expression for y of x comma epsilon, we'll perform a Taylor expansion of y with respect to epsilon around the solution that we know, which is epsilon equals zero. When we do that, we'll get y of x comma zero plus the partial of y with respect to epsilon at epsilon equals zero times epsilon over one factorial plus the second partial of y with respect to epsilon at epsilon equals zero times epsilon squared over two factorial, and so on. Now these partial derivatives at epsilon equals zero are really just functions of x. We've effectively eliminated epsilon as a variable by setting it to zero, leaving x as the only variable in these partial derivative expressions. 
So what I'll do is I'll let this y of x comma zero and all these partial derivatives equal y naught, y one, y two, etc. of x. And when I do this substitution, our perturbation solution looks like this. I'll call this equation two. The more terms we get in this perturbation solution, the better our solution will approximate the perturbed differential equation. Now that we've got the foundation, we can break down solving ODEs by perturbation methods into four simple steps. The first step is to substitute the perturbation solution into your differential equation and the boundary slash initial conditions. You don't actually have to write all the terms in the substitution, just be ready to use that substitution for the later steps. The second step is to set epsilon equals zero in the differential equation and the initial slash boundary conditions you start with. In other words, equations one up above. Once you set epsilon equals zero, solve the ODE and you'll end up with the solution, why not? The third step is to differentiate once both the differential equation and the initial slash boundary conditions with respect to epsilon. Once you do that, set epsilon equal to zero and solve the problem. You will now end up with the solution y1. The fourth step is to continue differentiating, setting epsilon equal to zero with each successive derivative and solving the resulting initial value or boundary value problem. And as you do that, you'll get y2, y3, y4, and so on, a better and better approximation of the perturbed solution. Now, the reason these steps work in obtaining the components of the perturbed solution is that when you look at the perturbed solution itself, steps two, three, and four, when applied to this perturbed solution, also give you y0, y1, y2, and so on. The components of the perturbed solution were defined according to these steps. For instance, if I take the first derivative of the perturbed solution and set epsilon equal to zero, the y naught goes away because it's a first derivative with respect to epsilon, and the other y's go away as well because we've set epsilon equal to zero. So in the end, we just end up with y1, which is exactly what is suggested by step three. In fact, dy by d epsilon at epsilon equal to zero was defined as y1 earlier, so it makes sense that we're getting it by doing step three. Anyway, enough of this theoretical stuff, let's do an actual example problem. Our goal is to solve this initial value problem consisting of a second order differential equation, its two initial conditions, and a nonlinear term epsilon times y to the power p, where p is some integer greater than or equal to two. The question also says to assume that epsilon is sufficiently small that powers of epsilon greater than or equal to two can be ignored. Let's solve this problem using these four steps that I mentioned above. We'll first set up our perturbation solution, which is just y naught plus epsilon times y1, because that's exactly how far we need to go for this question. Powers of epsilon such as epsilon squared times y2 over two plus epsilon cubed over six times y3 and so on, these higher powers of epsilon greater than or equal to two can be ignored here, as per what the question says. Let's now apply our four steps. As mentioned before, the first step is to substitute our perturbed solution y of x comma epsilon into the initial value problem. To do that, we need the first and second derivatives, which are just y naught prime plus epsilon times y one prime and y naught double prime plus epsilon times y one double prime. Note that the prime here means a derivative with respect to x. Now, plugging this into the initial value problem gives us the following. Because p is an integer greater than or equal to two, the expansion of this nonlinear term will include a y naught to the power p, while the remainder of the terms will include epsilon times y one to a power of one or greater. And if the remainder of the terms of this expansion alone contain epsilon times y one, and if we have epsilon on the outside as well, then all of the terms under these three dots can be ignored because they have a power of epsilon greater than or equal to two. And if we perform the simplification, we get the following initial value problem. Now that we've set things up, we can move on to the second step, which is to set epsilon equal to zero in the initial value problem and solve for y naught. The way to solve this resulting problem is fairly simple. Assume y naught is an exponential of some unknown coefficient r times x. You've probably covered this in your ODEs course, but I'm gonna go over it again. When we substitute this e to the rx into the differential equation, we end up with a polynomial equation that will give us two solutions for r. To get those solutions, we just factor the polynomial. So the two integers that add to four, the middle number, and multiply to three, the last number, 
are 3 and 1, so we have r plus 3 times r plus 1. The exponential itself can never be 0, so r plus 3 times r plus 1 must be 0, which gives us r1 equal to negative 3 and r2 equal to negative 1 as two of our solutions. This means that e to the negative 3x and e to the negative x are possible solutions for y0. So the total solution y0 must be a linear combination of these two possibilities. There's also two initial conditions that we need to worry about. The first is that y0 at x equal to 0 is 1, while the second is that y0 prime at x equal to 0 is negative 3. If we apply the first initial condition, we find that c1 plus c2 is 1, since the exponentials become 1 at x equal to 0. Then for y0 prime, the derivative is just negative 3c1 times the exponential of negative 3x minus c2 times the exponential of negative x. This means that by the second initial condition, negative 3 is equal to negative 3c1 minus c2. And if we solve these two equations for c1 and c2, which is like grade 4 level stuff, we find that c1 is 1 and that c2 is 0. Okay, maybe not grade 4, grade 9, but close enough, you get the idea. In any case, after solving the ODE and applying initial conditions, we find that y0 is e to the negative 3x. So we've done step 2, let's now move on to step 3. Here we have to differentiate the ODE and initial conditions in this box with respect to epsilon. Set epsilon equal to 0 and then solve to find our y1. When we perform the differentiation with respect to epsilon, everything that's out here in the parentheses of y0 goes away because those terms aren't multiplying epsilon. In addition, the initial conditions for y1, which are remaining after we differentiate away the epsilon, are just 0. Now we know from step 2 that y0 is e to the negative 3x, so that means that y0 to the p is just e to the negative 3px. As a result, we can move this y0 to the p term in our differential equation to the right and end up with this non-homogeneous ODE. Solving this ODE isn't too tough. The overall solution would include the solution to the homogeneous version of this ODE plus the particular solution. We already know from step 2 that the solution to the homogeneous form of this ODE, which was exactly what we solved in step 2, was c1 times e to the negative 3x plus c2 times e to the negative x. Here I'm going to use different constants c3 and c4 to avoid redundancy. For the particular solution, we can use the method of undetermined coefficients and add a yp that is ultimately similar to the non-homogeneous term of our differential equation. So in place of yp, we'll put some constant a times e to the negative 3px. In order to solve for a, we'll need to substitute y1 back into the ODE. But because these first two terms are part of the homogeneous solution, we only need to substitute the particular solution. That's because when we substitute the homogeneous part of the solution, it's going to add up to zero anyway, because it's homogeneous after all. If you don't believe me, you can substitute it yourself and see that I'm right. So let's substitute just the particular solution into our ODE for y1. The second derivative will be 9p squared times a times the exponential. The first derivative will be negative 3p times a times the exponential, and we already know what the particular solution itself is. When we solve this for a, here's what we get. And if we now plug in this a into y1 and solve for c3 and c4 using our two initial conditions, you can show yourself that here's what we end up with. I didn't do the full calculation because it would take too long and wouldn't add anything to your knowledge about perturbation theory. I already demonstrated how to use the initial conditions to find the unknown integration constants, so I trust that you can repeat that same technique here. Now since this is our y1, and we already have y0, our overall solution to the nonlinear ODE by the perturbation method is the following. And that completes our example problem for using perturbation methods. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.